Hello to my friends at Car Church, friends and family. It's good to be with you again tonight. I am coming to you live on Facebook. I know others will watch this on YouTube or watch it archived on Facebook uh, from a um, undisclosed location in Georgia. We'll call it that. Uh, but I'm blessed to be with you this evening. Uh, excited to bring the word. I'm by myself tonight. Uh, Patty is back home in North Carolina. Uh, so I want us to open up with prayer. And if you have your Bible with you, we're going to begin tonight in the book of Psalms 119. So you can go ahead and turn there, Psalm 119. We're going to begin around verse 9. And our topic tonight is deliverance from defeat. And as I think we frequently find in Car Church, uh, you're going to discover that our approach tonight will be maybe uh, to take something that we know and is familiar to us and look at it through the light of the revelation of Christ in us. So let's, let's start with prayer tonight. Father, I'm just so thankful for everybody that is able to participate in this uh, thing that we've come to call Car Church. Lord, it's a time of fellowship. It's a time in your word. It's a time in the presence of your spirit, Lord, like Zechariah talked about a wall of fire, that you'd be a wall of fire around us and your presence in our midst, your glory in our midst. And that's what we pray tonight, Lord. I pray for the person tonight that's been struggling, perhaps, with feeling very defeated. They've seen a pattern of failure or of setbacks, and they're just in need, Lord, tonight of an, a word of encouragement and hope. I just pray that as we go into your word tonight, that you'd awaken our understanding and grant us revelation to see things in new ways. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're beginning tonight in Psalm 119, and we're going to look at verse 9 through verse 11. This is a familiar passage of Scripture, and the verse that I'm going to read particularly tonight I think is quite familiar to most people. But I want us to look at it through the lens of God's revelation in a unique way. It says in Psalm 119, verse 9, How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word, with my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. And then he says this in verse 11, kind of our key verse tonight. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let me say that again. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, for the first, I don't know how many years, probably well over a decade of my Christian life, I read that verse of Scripture, and it was explained to me uh, fairly early on that to hide the Word of God in my heart meant to memorize Scripture. And uh, I memorized Scripture, and I'm thankful I know a lot of Scripture by memory. And I'm thankful that I have that uh, option of knowing the Scriptures by memory. But I want to suggest to you tonight that this scripture has so much more of a profound meaning than simply the idea of memorizing scripture. Because can I tell you the honest truth is, memorizing scripture does a lot to helping me understand what I should be doing, how I should be living, uh, what God's commands are. But memorizing scripture alone does not have within it the power of transforming my life or giving me the ability to perform that which I know. But in my mind, I was taught if I would hide the Word of God in my heart, in other words, I would memorize Scripture, that's the way I perceived it, then I uh, would not sin against the Lord. But I have to be honest with you and tell you that I did sin against the Lord even when I memorized Scripture. Because my definition of sin is more than just, you know, sexual immorality or drunkenness or some kind of impurity or the things that we tend to think about sin. My definition of sin is that sin is a self-inspired narrative. A self-inspired narrative means it's a story that I write without God. I'm the author of it and I'm the implementer of it. The reason why I say that is because if you think about it, Adam and Eve in the garden, 
they didn't commit what we would consider some kind of a heinous crime. What they did is they had a story or a narrative that had been told them by God, and then they had another narrative that was told them by the enemy. And they chose to begin to write their own narrative in alignment with the enemy's lies rather than in alignment with the truth of God's word. And the result was that self-inspired narrative caused them to lead the entire human race into a fallen condition. Now, it looks as though what they did was a relatively small or minor infraction, but in fact, it had a gargantuan impact. So when I think about sin, I think about a self-inspired narrative. I think about me writing the story of my life, writing the story of my day, writing the story of my ambitions, writing the story of my desires, writing my story on my own and leaving God out of it, choosing for myself. Even if what I'm choosing to do is something that I think would be a blessing to him, yet it's not coming from him, it's coming from me. I'm writing the story and I'm leaving him out of the narrative. Well, what I've discovered is that by simply memorizing Scripture, though I place high value on that, don't misunderstand me, but there's more to hiding the Word in your heart than just memorizing Scripture. Why is that? Well, it's because we need to understand that if we're going to stop our self-inspired narratives, which a self-inspired narrative always is an act of independence, it's always an act of me living my life outside of the power, the presence, the life, the wisdom, the counsel, the anointing, the dynamic and animating power of Christ in me. When I do that, uh, I am stepping into independence and that's what leads me to defeat. Because what I've done is I've stepped into my own strength, I've stepped into my own wisdom, I've stepped into my own will, I've stepped into my own desires, and the result is I've acted independent of God, and when I act independent of God, then I wind up defeated, and the enemy is able to uh, cause me to fall or fail. Exactly what happened to Adam and Eve in the continuation of every subsequent act. Whenever man acts on his own, independent from the life and the spirit, the presence and power of the Lord, he is acting independently and it results in him falling or defeat. So how can we reverse that process of defeat and come from defeat to a place of deliverance from defeat, come to a place of victory, come to a place of success in our walk with Christ? Well, it's not by redetermining and uh, setting our mind to it. It's not by a renewed effort on our part or a rededication of our determination. The scripture says that the way in which we get to that place where we don't sin against the Lord, self-inspired narratives against the Lord, acts of independence against the Lord, resulting in defeat is by doing something. Verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not act out self-inspired narratives in opposition and independence of you, resulting in defeat. So what does this mean? If it doesn't mean simply or exclusively to memorize scripture, though that's certainly a very important thing to do, what does it mean? Well, to answer the question, which we've answered before, but it never, it never ceases to amaze me how important it is for us to renew and renew and renew and renew our mind about these things. We have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to hide the word in our heart? Well, first of all, we have to realize, as we've said so many times before, there's something more to the word than just the written word on pages or the engraved word in tablets of stone. And let's look real quickly over at John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and looking at verse 1, and here we begin to see a broader, deeper, more profound understanding of exactly what it means to hide the Word in our heart. Well, in verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
And then in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here it tells us again, as we've talked about many times, that the word of God is more than principles and precepts that are written for our admonition and to call us to obey them as a rule of living. But the word is actually a person who himself embodies those precepts and principles and who alone is capable of implementing and manifesting those principles perfectly because he is the word made flesh. And we're talking about Jesus. Jesus, the scripture tells us, is the word, was with God, was God, and became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. If you look over at the book of John chapter 15, John chapter 15 and looking at verse 7, here Jesus is speaking in the red part of your Bible, and he says these words, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And then verse 4 tells us, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So he's speaking about his word abiding in us, and he speaks about that in relationship like a branch to a vine. And what he's saying in essence is that unless you are living out of me, that's what branches do. They live out of the vine. The vine is their source of life. Unless you live out of me and my word is abiding in you, then you, you're not going to be able to bear fruit. Because apart from me, he makes it very clear, you can do nothing. So again, we're seeing that the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and now he's telling us that we need to dwell in him and he needs to dwell in us. And who is he? He is the Word. I want you to see this. We're going to keep proving it from Scripture. Let's look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John 1 verse 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we've seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's saying, we, he existed before the beginning. In the beginning was the word. We've heard about him. We've seen him with our eyes. We've gazed upon him. Our hands have handled what? The word of life. In other words, Jesus is the word of life made flesh. Jesus is the embodiment of the mind, the will, the emotion, the desire, the nature, the character of God. In the beginning was the word, logos, the mind, the will, the emotion, the character, the nature of God, and the mind, will, nature, and character of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's who Jesus was. So now he's telling us that we've handled the word. He's not talking about we've handled this. He's talking about we've handled Christ. We have seen him, gazed upon him, heard him. So what, what we're talking about is deliverance from defeat. Defeat comes when we act independently of the spirit and life of the Lord. When Adam and Eve in the garden acted independently of the spirit and the life of the Lord, the result was they wrote a self-inspired narrative, sin, S-I-N, self-inspired narrative, and they ended in defeat and they fell. Why? Because of their independence. Now the psalmist tells us in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not write a self-inspired narrative ending in fall and defeat against God. And what does that mean? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
If you abide in me and my word abides in you, we have seen, we've heard, we've gazed upon, we've handled the word of life. He's talking about a person, the person of Jesus Christ. It's not just memorizing scripture, but it is finding the person of Christ in us and we in him as a branch to the vine. I get so excited about it. You think I'd get tired of this. I don't get tired of it. I get energized every time I'm opening the word to talk about these things because it's so revolutionary when you really begin to understand what the Lord is saying to us. Now, again, we're proving this idea that the word and Christ are one and the same. Look what it says here now in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Peter 1, verse 22 says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, how? Through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Then look what he says in verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower fails, falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. You see, we've literally been born again, how? By the Spirit of God. And what is the Spirit of The Spirit of Christ taking up residence inside of us is the word of God, and we are born of that incorruptible power of his life. His life is that incorruptible seed, that life that comes from the Lord himself. That's why the word life even that's used here is in the Greek, the Greek word zoe, which means the life that God alone possesses. It means the life that alone should be called life. It means eternal life, the life that exists in God and has been made available to us. That's why Jesus said, I am come that you might have life, zoe. I'm come to you might have the very life that God himself has living in you by the agency of my spirit coming inside of you, the incorruptible life of my life in yours, as I make your spirit alive and then I come and dwell in you by my spirit. Now we begin to think about what does it mean, thy word have I hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. In other words, what gives me the potential to believe I can be delivered from the defeat of self-inspired narratives where I write my own story and leave God out of it by acting independently and find, finding myself in defeat and failure, the hope that I can avoid that or be delivered from it is that I, I see Christ himself, the word uh, that was with God, that was God, that became flesh, that dwelt among us, that we've handled, that we've seen, that person of Jesus Christ, that incorruptible life of Christ, now is in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And because I've hidden the word, Jesus himself, in my heart, now he is able to, through me, give me the ability to live a life in concert with and not independent of the Lord. So that his life now begins to be expressed through my life in Christ even when he was on the earth, said, I only do those things which please the Father. The works that I do are the works I see the Father doing. The words that I speak are the words the Father gives me. So if Christ is in me, and I am, as Paul said, the life I'm now living, I'm living by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ, who is Christ the Word, liveth in me. The more that I allow that to happen, the more that my actions will be dependent upon his life, expressions of his life, the fewer and fewer self-inspired narratives and independent actions I'm going to take. And instead of falling into defeat, I'll see that Christ is able to carry me into victory by the power of his life. Your word... I have hidden in my heart <laughs> that I might not sin against you. So much more than just memorizing the scripture, as precious as that is, but actually inviting and allowing the very spirit and life of Christ himself to take up resonance inside of us. That's why it says, look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4. And here Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and we've read this many times, but notice again what he says here in verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure. What's this treasure? It's the life of Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. If you look there at verse 6, it says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you see this? It is God who commanded light to shine in our hearts. Thy word have I hidden in my heart. And where does this come? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And he's placed this treasure of the life of Christ himself, he's placed this treasure in this earthen vessel made of clay, made of dirt. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power would be of God and not of us. You see, if I have this paradigm that we talk about all the time, that the way I approach my Christianity is Jesus died for me, he finished his part on the cross, now he's called me to live my life for him, so now out of the power of my own strength and will and determination and devotion, I'm going to redouble my efforts to live a life that is worthy of the sacrifice that Christ did for me in gratitude and appreciation for that, then I'm going to read this verse of scripture and I'm going to say, okay, I, I, thy word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So because I'm going to live my life for Jesus, I'm going to memorize, 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 memorize lots and lots of scripture so that I can then have lots of ammunition to draw upon so that I can defeat sin and be victorious. If that's how we're living in that paradigm, that's how we see things. But when we live out of the paradigm that Jesus died on the cross for me so that I would be qualified for him to come and take up residence inside of me and live in me and live through me by the power of his life. If I come into that paradigm, if I understand that perspective, then I read a verse of scripture that says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And instead of me thinking of it as something that I've got to do to amass information and knowledge so that I can draw upon that to try and find a way to defeat sin, I realize what I've done is I've hidden Christ in my heart. The, that God has shown in the face of Jesus the light in my heart. And he's put the treasure of his life in my earth and clay. And because he's in me, because he is perfect, because he has all the power, because he has all the strength, because all that he does is that which pleases the Father. As I cease depending, rather cease acting in independence on my own, trying to produce the life that I can't produce, I live in dependence upon his life, asking him to express and reveal his life through me. Now I'm in a place where the word, Jesus himself, is hidden in my heart. And he is the one who can give me the capacity not to sin against him. Oh, saints, this so thrills me. Every time, I just am always amazed. You know, I didn't have this in my notes, but let's look again at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, this is so clearly portrayed. Ezekiel 36, 26, written centuries before Christ revealed himself on the earth. Now, centuries before this, the prophet Ezekiel was told this was what God was up to. I think this is why Jesus was so uh, taken aback by the fact that Nicodemus didn't know that, you, that a person had to be born again, born of the Spirit, in John chapter 3, because he knew that this was in the Scripture centuries before Christ came. Look what he says in Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I, this is God speaking, will give you, that's you and me, a new heart and put a new spirit within you. 
I will take the heart of stone, the dead human spirit, out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, a living spirit, a new regenerated, reborn spirit. Then verse 27, this is key. This is so key. We've missed this. We know that when we accept Christ, we are born again. Our spirit is made alive again. Our spirit was dead. We were dead in our sins and trespasses, the Bible says, without hope, without God in the world. We know that when we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. Our spirit is made alive again. We're born again, spiritually made alive. But what we, so many people don't know is the reason why God re awakened and regenerated our human spirit. It's because, verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. The cause of that is him, his spirit. The place in which that cause shows up is on the branch. The vine is the cause, the branch is the result, the fruit that comes. So again, what are we talking about here? We're talking about deliverance from defeat. Defeat comes from independent action. Defeat comes from self-inspired narratives. It leads from independent action to a self-inspired narrative, which leads to failure and defeat. So how do we find deliverance from that? Well, we find deliverance from it by no longer attempting to act independently, neither for evil or for good, neither to try and rebel against God, nor to try and serve God. We don't try and act independently in any way. What we do is we quickly recognize that the only hope we have that we would not sin against the Lord is the fact that his word, Christ himself, by his spirit, has taken up residence inside of us. And the word, Christ himself, that has been hidden in our heart is alone the one who can then cause us to be able to actualize walking out his statutes, keeping his judgments, and doing them. It's his life and the dynamic of his life that gives the capacity for that obedience. That's why I say that if we read this verse simply, I'm going to memorize scripture so that I know what I need to do so that I will do, then uh, go out and do it, I'm missing the entire point because the memorization and knowledge of what I need to do does not give me the power to do it. If anything, it just makes me an expert on what I'm not doing because I cannot do it. If I want to stop sinning self-inspired narratives against God, the only way it can happen is for the word, Jesus himself, to take up resonance in me. His word I've hidden in my heart. His word, his word, his spirit alive in me. Oh, saints, I, I don't even know, I can hardly contain myself. I'm so full of the joy of the knowledge of the difference this makes. So what would happen if we came to the place where we realized the word of God is more than precepts and principles, as we said before. The word of God is a person who alone has the power to perform the precepts and principles of kingdom character. When we understand that, when we grasp that, then we see that sin, which scriptural definition is to miss the way, to forfeit, to bear loss, to lose oneself, to wander from the way, to become liable to a penalty or forfeiture of something, to miss out on an allotment or an inheritance. That's what sin means. When we operate in independent action, self-inspired narratives, inevitably independence from the life of, of the Lord is going to result in defeat, failure, and loss and forfeiture. When on the other hand, we stop trying, even as a Christian, to act like a Christian, independent of the life of Christ himself, by simply trying to be like Jesus or act like Jesus acted. If instead we realize if we'll stop trying to act like Jesus, then Jesus can begin to act like himself through us. 
and we can begin to yield to and surrender to his life. So I'm going to kind of pull to a close tonight. When you begin to think from the paradigm of Jesus died for me to reconcile me to the Father so that I would then qualify for his spirit to come and make my spirit alive and then take up residence inside my spirit and then begin to, by the power of his life, express his character and nature through me as I yield and surrender to him. When I live out of that paradigm, I read a verse like this, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And I say, Lord, I'm so thankful that you live in me. I'm so thankful that what I can't do, you can do. What I don't know, you do know. What I'm incapable of, you're capable of. What I have no power to perform, you have all power to perform. What, what is impossible to me is possible to you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when is my strength made perfect? In my weakness. I'm the earthen vessel. He's the treasure. And knowing that he is in me, why would I ever try and act like him and fail miserably, stepping out in my own independent strength, capacity, and ability, when he himself is in me, willing to act as himself through me? If I would yield to him, surrender to him, and relinquish control of my life. I don't even know that the psalmist fully understood the depths of the profound revelation he was speaking when he said, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But the Holy Spirit knew. The Holy Spirit knew that the true word of God, Jesus himself, Revelation says on his thigh are written these words, the word of God. When we understand that Jesus is that word dwelling in us and his word dwelling in us, and as we abide in him and abide in his life as a branch to the vine, his life nourishing sap begins to flow through us and his life, which is in perfect dependence upon the Father is perfect harmony with the Spirit. His life expressed through us doesn't take us into independence leading to defeat. It takes us into complete dependence, ending in great success and victory as Christ overcomes the enemy. Because greater is he that is in me. Not greater am I, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Have you been struggling with defeat? Have you believed that you needed to redouble your efforts, recommit yourself, strengthen your devotion, dig in deeper, try harder, work more so that you won't continually fall into defeat against the Lord? Or are you where I am? Realizing apart from him, we can't do anything. When you take a zero ability and you redouble your effort, what do you have? You still got zero. Zero times zero equals zero. Nothing times nothing equals nothing. Apart from him, I can do nothing. So I'm going to redouble my apart from him efforts. And what will I end up with? A double nothing. <laughs> But with him, everything becomes possible. In the most practical way I can say, this means that we have to change our perspective. Our entire mindset, intentionality, and aspiration has to become to learn how to cooperate with the word, Christ himself, which has been hidden in our heart, the treasure that is in this earthen vessel. We have to realize that by our willingness to cooperate with, get out of the way of, relinquish control to the power of his life 
in us, then the word which has been hidden in our heart by the Spirit of God can then begin to produce through us a life of victory and not defeat. Saints, as I'm coming to a close now, I just want to say to you what a tremendous gift it is for me to be with you every week. I pray that the consistent and persistent speaking of this message of Christ in us, the hope of glory, is producing in you a deeper hunger, a deeper understanding. I pray that it's eliminating and removing from you the false belief that it's about human striving, effort, work, or labor. My prayer is that in the days ahead, more and more and more, our self-inspired narratives, even our religious or Christian self-inspired narratives, where we do the work on behalf of the Lord, and he is the object of our actions, that will shift to a new place where we realize that it's only he who can do the work through us. And instead of him being the object of our actions, he becomes the origin of his own action through us. When that happens, success is guaranteed because he, through us, has the capacity to succeed where we, for him, can only fail. I want to close tonight in prayer, and I want to just ask the Holy Spirit to seal what we've talked about tonight. Lord, I hear these words, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Lord, help me to understand you are the word. You are the word of God. And as I hide you in my heart, the scriptures are all pointing to you, revealing you, agreeing with your nature and character. But apart from your own life in us, all they can do is show us where we're wrong. But with you in us, the word in us, you alone have the ability to help us to do, to do through us what your word calls us to. What a joy to know that. Father, we thank you and we give you praise tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Say with me, the word, Jesus, is hidden in my heart that I no longer have to sin in self-inspired narratives against him. In Jesus' name, amen. Many blessings to you all tonight. God bless. Lord willing, we'll see you next Sunday night. Good night.